Yeah, it is. Uh, welcome back uh, to our, our redo of our National Poetry Month event. We're here and we're not even going to reference the thing that happened. It's all about the positivity of where we're at now and how we're moving forward. Um, Y'all should know that based on what happened last time, I did end up, because um, I had it, the reading as something that students could come to for extra credit. Um, so a way to push back on the negativity is that I gave all my students in those classes extra credit because, you know, uh, we need to normalize positive things happening in um, academia. We need more of that. All right, so I'm your host, Dr. Jose Angel Aragos, and I'm excited for, um, what is gonna happen tonight, which is a, a night of poetry. We have three fantastic readers. Um, Anantu Faha is a junior here at Suffolk University. She'll be opening um, our reading with a poem that she wrote for this event. And then followed by that, we'll have Ruja Mohasesi and then Adiba Shahid Talukdar to round us out. Um, and yeah, uh, Hanan is helping me kind of behind the scenes as well during the reading that she's gonna She's going to open up our ceremony here and have a moment to shine. Um, just to share a bit about her, Anantu Faha is a junior at Suffolk University, majoring in English with a concentration in creative writing and a minor in women and gender studies. She's involved on campus as a president of, uh, president of Unspoken Feelings, Suffolk Spoken Word Poetry Club. They do a lot of cool work. Um, and she also works as a diversity peer educator at the Center for Student Diversity and Inclusion. They are also part of the Honors College as well as holds a position as an archives assistant at the Mowgli Archives. Some of her literary work is published in Venture, the university student-run literary magazine. And I have the um, um, honor of working with her as uh, she, she interns for Salamander Magazine, which I'm editor-in-chief of. So really excited to have her open up this celebration of poetry. So let me add her as a spotlight. And then I will remove myself and Hana, take it away. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm going to read a poem. Um, this one is one that I wrote specifically for National Poetry Month, and it's just on why I write poetry. Sometimes living on paper is easier than walking through the world in my body. It's invisible umbrella riddled with holes always exposed because living in verse makes me feel like I can be the ruler of this kingdom. I can be its king and its queen and I will always be kept safe by my fierce snipes. Living between the lines of reality and a fantasy world until the storm simmers down is a lot easier than trying to explain to my therapist why I'm depressed why I document my life on paper rather than living it. In writing this, I realized that I am not only a poetry collection, I am also a novel with sequels and a happy ending with a protagonist and antagonist that both look like me. I am a fairy tale and a horror story all in one. I am also an old music album you can't stop listening to after so many years because the words just speak to you. My writing is my music. The lyrics that allow my story to live on for generations after me, I am a poet because I want to be eternal. And my words will stick to this page forever set in stone. Though my body will be long gone, my heart will continue to beat in the pages you turn. And my voice will tell my story. will read to you about the one who lived on metaphors and imagery to help her escape the shackles of her mind who found shelter in words she made up. This is the home I have built myself with paper and pen and the cards I was dealt, and I will revel in it. I am a poet because I want to bring myself to life. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Anon. That was awesome. Um, feel free to show love in the chat. We've got the chat open um, for people to um, there it is. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Um, and yeah, I was really struck by your line. My writing is my music. I was um, working and talking with writers um, earlier today. Um, and there was some talk of like marketing and all that. But I, I always want to pin like I always 
like I wish I had something more complex to say than the way to keep writing is to keep writing, but that's really what it is. And it's like understanding, uh, the understanding that comes with um, a line like that, my writing is my music, like that's what it is. It's like this thing that we're just privileged to be a, a part of, to, to be alive and feel it. Um, all right. Thank you again, Hanan, that was beautiful, agreed. So moving on to Ruja, Ruja Mohasesi is an Iranian born poet and educator. She is a McDowell fellow and an MFA graduate of Pacific University in Oregon. Uh, hey, that's the old hood. We, we should share Oregon stories. Uh, her debut collection, When Your Sky Runs Into Mine, was a winner of the 22nd annual Elixir Poetry Award. Her poems and reviews have appeared in Narrative Magazine, Poet Lore, Rhino Poetry, Southern Humanities Review, Calix Journal, Ninth Letter, Green City Review, The Adroit Journal, New Letters, The Florida Review, Poetry Northwest, The Pinch, The Rumpus, The Journal, and elsewhere. And yeah, I encourage y'all to like hang back and be ready to um, experience poetry that is guided by image and by voice in such distinct ways. So please help me welcome but uh, Ruja Mohasasi. Can you hear me? Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Jose, for the invite. It's wonderful to be here. Um, and uh, it's an honor to be reading with, uh, with Adiba and uh, Hanan. I'm going to start with a poem that is um, not in my collection, um, that is in, uh, in response to the um, the women-led uprisings that started about seven months ago in Iran. And um, it's still ongoing, though it has changed form and it's becoming more of a, of a civil disobedience um, where women are, are, um, are finding different ways to ask um, for their freedom. Sweet is the truth of a nation on your lips. The river stones are listening, Yusef Konyaka, for Nasrin Shakaramini Ka's mother. Tav, bitter is the afternoon and minutes away from midnight when they, they are the street corner where her mobile phone is silenced for good, the postmortem nine days and nights in a morgue where perspiring walls preserve forensic details the truth on a toe tag, the once smooth and rolling slope of her skull depressed to a hollow, broken cheekbones loosely housing scant teeth. They are the repeated and again sal kub, sal as in a daughter's head unveiled, luring light, kub is the pounding momentum of nightsticks. The rest of her nesting, you say, was salem as in wholesome her fingers, thighs, the lengths of her arms, her soles, the torso stitched shut. They are sin, committed before the first light on the 10th day, Najes, the ambush on the dead, the unchaste pairs of hands on the gurney after your hands, Nasrin, had dressed her in three pristine sheets of kafan after rites and ablutions after the warm stream had run its course down, the right, then left, length of her, and left her, scented with camphor and prayers. They, a grave hack through the shallow roots of thorn and thistle, the haste, a hearse and daughter lost in a convoy of country dust before the first azan. Half, bitter now the silence on your street, Nasreen, shirin the truth of a nation on your lips. In a house in mourning, rows of gladiolas are lined up against the wall now, stiff swords in tall buckets, their tips catching inklings of light. Next, I'm going to read a few poems from uh, When Your Sky Runs Into Mine, the collection that came out 
a few months ago. Um, the collection turned into sort of uh, a memoir, even though I did not really want to write a memoir. <laughs> the poems kind of arranged themselves into this chronological order and um, I came to terms with it. It's fine, it's working. I'm very happy with it. And um, I'm going to start with a poem that is about my experience um, of um, begging my grandmother to fast with her during the months of Ramazan when I was a child. And uh, children usually are, uh, they don't fast until we're, until we reach puberty. And uh, so I would pester her year after year. And then I think when I was about 10 or so, finally, she said, well, you can fast for half a day. And, um, and so this is dedicated to my grandmother. Ramazan in Tajrish for Mada. You nudged me with a whisper to rise an hour before Azan from under the thick of dove feathers, warm with your love for God and me, the musty grandchild who had rushed the weekdays to arrive at you and you were already more in love and old like walnut trees. Little did I understand of the hours past the shuffle of shadows, why they felt solicitous, safe only at your home like uncles who dropped their manliness at your door, removed their shoes and stooped through the narrow frame to greet you. Whether I hurried out of your bed to meet God at my paisley prayer mat, the cotton John and Ma's you hand by hand, or to putter after you out and into sunlit rooms was moot. Little did I understand of the prayer in your gate for the faint dehydrated child the afternoon hours ran from the setting sun while your white shador shifted faithfully about you, sprinkled with flowers, deferential with the remaining minutes. Though too young to fast, even then I knew when I pestered you with a 10 year old's dogged demands to rouse me for Sahari, the day old lavash we tore like a promise between us, buttered at near dawn and to keep our secret from Mama and Baba. I knew in your low cloud voice that would nudge my sleeping cheek only once, did you think I would not hear you? In the reluctance of it lodged the caress of those childhood days. I never get tired of reading this one. There are some poems I've been reading so much, there are some poems I'm like, I can't read this one anymore. This is not one of them. Sometimes when the poems are really dark, it's hard to read them. Um, this next one is, um, is um, about a memory uh, of uh, my childhood in Iran. I, was, I lived in Iran um, for, I was there for the first four years of the Iran-Iraq war. So the uh, right after the uh, 1978 revolution in Iran, the Iraq, um, in the Iran-Iraq war started that lasted eight years. And I was there for the first four years. And um, one time a bullet came through the uh, my bedroom window and uh, it grazed the column in the house. And, and we actually couldn't find the bullet for, for, for weeks. And we, we looked and looked and eventually we found it. Childhood. Juliet, the dice was loaded from the start, Mark Knopfler. Frightened, my childhood refused to attend my life, though I invited it repeatedly. Shy and broken, it handed me shards I dusted off, demonstrating how to assess the depth before easing into pain. I blew on its sore eyes, resorted to lies, your desk, I said and the imploded hole to your right on the cross-taped window will still be here, sparkling like the stars above when you return. Meanwhile, I promised, I'll continue to search for the bullet lost in the house. This next one is, um, 
dedicated to my mother. Believers, for Fadi Bob. When he said they're deaf, dumb, and blind, so they will not return, God meant, had we died in her arms, my mother would have carried on spoon feeding until certain we were safely enshrined our halos on exhibit. Nor did she turn to salt. Even now she looks back, though unsure of what exactly was looted, the year the milk of the rubber tree on the back porch dried up, she couldn't hear. But they carried away the grating rattle of her pots, giggles that died at dinner. Hunger stayed and reached with our thin manacled mouths for rationed wafers that perched higher on the shelf where nothing wished to be disturbed. It wasn't like an earthquake. My mother couldn't hear the night sky rip into starry strips. She felt the warheads rumble, listened with her feet. She kept flat under the table. With two gold bangles chiming on each of our wrists and the double strand of jasmine wilting on our chests, my mother had meant to say we were believers, though she'd never read the Quran nor heard the Azan. Thank you. I have some uh, some poems in here that uh, I call my rage and rant poems. Not too many, but I have a few. And uh, I debated whether to keep them or not. Was worried about offending some people, but then in, in the end I decided that they do reflect a part of my experience. And, uh, and in fact, I'm really glad that I kept them because as I go reading in different places, especially at universities, th this, these ones are very popular with, with the students. It gives, them, it gives them, I think, permission and a model for writing their own anger and for, for voicing their own darkness. And I should say this one is in the voice of a... Um, I guess a person in the position of power uh, in uh, addressing a refugee. Interview for asylum after Sylvia Plath. Discarding your hijab is non-negotiable, ma'am. I've made a note of the signs of torture on your face, but you'll need to hold in piss till told what's next, insists the officer. Yes, this is a free country, smiles graciously. We are indiscriminate with positions that indulge our kicks. In effect, the process is rather involved. He continues, for starts, you'll need to second guess, divine a way to ravish. The nude inside of a thigh, the front slit of a skirt will do for openers, though rather common. You'll need to support yourself on your arms and keep at it till we come. It won't be long. Let us examine your profile, please stand scrutinizes her face closely. In time, you'll need to carve and discard the inordinate chunks of your cheeks, reject the ridges of your congenital jaw, returns to his desk. Now remember, low jobs should be airy. Be sure to make room. As for your blood, it's thick. It extends too far back, examining the documents. Have you kept a record? No, drain it then. Soon you won't be needing it to draw from. Please step up on the scale now. Oh, how inadequate, you clearly cannot endure. Deficient, malinformed, possibly abused during transport, almost dark from some country, dumb, likely slow to come, artlessly insecure. And your tongue, utter a few words, would you? Discordant, do you hear it? Can it be tuned? Oh, so quiet, terrified, beyond despair. She'll never serve, send her back. The assistant points to a clause in the document. She'll be getting old anyhow. There's little we can do for her now. A dark one, but it needed writing. And this is um, the last poem I'm going to read. It's the poem that closes the collection. And uh, it's dedicated to my great-grandmother. My great-grandmother was a pretty amazing woman. I, I um, She lived to be 100. And um, we would go visit her on a weekly, every every um, weekend we would visit the two grandmothers. And um, 
and she was a healer. She would, uh, toward, she, towards the end of her life, if she was in pain, she self-medicated with these tiny doses of opium. And um, so this is for her. My only bangle for Khanum Jun, my great grandmother after Lucille Clifton. Today, I celebrate my only bangle, my one hand applause, the gold leaf on my family tree, my hand hammered heritage, my blood. Today, it refused to slide off a rounded portal, barring my hand in spite of the sweet talking soap, the slip of cold cream in spite of not matching my low cut cocktail dress, my silver choker. It cleaved to knuckle and bone, held me by the wrist, each unalloyed carat ablaze. Here, it whispered, rub some coal under your eyes before you step out, then let me hear you pronounce your name. Thank you all. It's wonderful to be here with you. Oh, no. Thank you so much. That was lovely. Oh, man. Now we got some you got some love in the chat and I'm, I'm with you on the chills of some very moving poems here, Ruja. Um, I just finished reading Franz Kafka's The Trial and that did, that does take me back, like your second to last poem took me back to some of that that tone of uh, the, the authority tone and just how, um, the, what authority has become in our world. Basically, I think it's the way to sum it up without going into the whole tangle of it. So anyway, thank you for sharing those poems. Um, really important stories we're moving forward. Yes. All right, so I will now introduce Adiva, who uh, hot new poet, hot new poet. Um, let me say, let me give the formal introduction or her bio real quick, and then I'll I want you to. I, anyway, I'm I'm already being weird. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm happy that Adiva's here. I'm happy everyone's here. And you know what? I need to take that moment. I've been nervous um, coming into this, but. Um, Thank you all for making the time to spend time with poetry, to um, take this time to listen and, and be here for not just these poets, but also for yourself and taking time with them to appreciate these things. Um, and whatever you survived to get here, thank you. Thank you for being here. So our final reader, Adiba Shahid Talukter, is a poet, vocalist, and translator of Urdu and Persian poetry. She's the author of What Is Not Beautiful, Glass Poetry Press, 2018, and her debut collection, Shar e Janan, The City of the Beloved, is, is was the winner of the Kundaman Poetry Prize. Very proud of that. Her poetry has appeared in Home a Day, Gulf Coast, Poetry Daily and the Margins, and her translations in PBS Frontline. I didn't know about that one. That's that's dope. And Words Without Borders. Adiba has received fellowships from Kundaman and Poets House and holds an MFA in creative writing from the University of Michigan. Um, and Adiba is um, an old friend, an old friend. Um, and I knew uh, she was, I, first time I met Adiba, uh, she was a student of mine while I was completing my MFA at NYU. And I knew we were gonna hit it off because I walked in the door that first day and here was this poet with two journals in front of her. And in one she wrote um, right to left and the other one she wrote, left to right and I'm just like whoa this poet is right in two languages and is like physically like this is how necessary words are that I have two journals and I'm just like this is someone I'm I'm gonna connect with and sure enough here we are uh, many years later I won't share years um but but yeah it's been an awesome friendship I'm very proud of all the good work you've done and um I it's been long and coming to be able to host you at a place so I'm really excited to have you here and for y'all to um, experience this work. So anyway, without further ado, uh, Adiba, take it away. Not sure why you're not unmuted. Let's, um... Thanks. Okay. Um, that's okay. I'm not saying anything important. Um, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I really value your friendship as well. Um, 
So uh, I'm a lot of the poems I'm going to be reading are from my in progress manuscript, um, which was once called Water and Clay, and now it's called Salpi, uh, which is um, the uh, the word for cupbearer or the person who pours the wine. Um, and sorry, I've been working all day. <laughs> really tired um but yeah uh so it's the uh, um and the manuscript kind of explores the sort of uh my relationship with music with my relationship with mental illness and um religion um all of which sort of converged in my mom's approach to my um you know, uh, my, my relationship with music. Um, so yeah, I'll just start reading. Episode in which Ghalib's grandeur is clothed with the scarlet of a woman who has lost everything. A white room, my madness jeweled, the wedding night sacred and red, gold glimmering. A nurse watched as I scribbled quickly in black crayon like a prophet. God knows what poetry those sheets held and what golden threads of my imagination were snipped that night. I waited for you and longed and grieved and when you didn't arrive, I began to sing softly the notes of lamentation. I was not fated to see my beloved tonight and then louder, a spectacle, a child's tantrum, a god's rage, a man's pleading at the execution grounds. Without shame or veil, my voice rose, soared above that cruel night and found and troubled God. The wine of my existence spilled from its delicate cup with rapture and purpose. Ummi, terrified, wept and implored God to forgive me and to forgive her for letting the storm entangle of me coiled, burst forth as a flood of sin. And when I at last descended and lost everything of light, I could not sing again without the air getting caught in my throat and Ummi rising abruptly to pray. Her white dupatta clothed my sky, and her prayers undid the knots of dark magic, and made of my voice again a shrine, and gave it the softness and restraint of a drawn arrow. I cried out, I have to sing to feel like I'm breathing. You advised, if you must sing, put your mouth inside an earthenware pot, then sing. I, despite how much I love ghazals um, and how much I try to sing and translate them, I have rarely um, written one. Um, and this is my most serious attempt at writing a ghazal in English. It's titled ghazal, as ghazals are titled. Ghazal. Every saint and prophet has known madness, a chilling, restless, lone madness. Majnun in rapture cries out for Leila, heart aflame with the stone's madness. Let the starved man set his field ablaze. What won't burn when you've sown madness? Dear God, spare me the light of you. I've tried and tried to disown madness. Move deeper into Yemen's darkness. The tabla will rise to an unknown madness. One cold night, they found her alone, hungry, trembling in full-blown madness. Follow him down the road of his exile, the madman's quiet in his own madness. Shahid, my love, sing with restraint. You haven't learned to hone madness. So the ghazal references Yemen, which is Iraq, um, which is sort of a, it's sort of a musical universe. I, I would uh, describe it as it. Uh, the closest word to it in English is mode, um, but it's not quite a mode. It's more expansive. Um, 
So this is what um, Yaman makes me feel like. Yaman and evening raga. Yaman, day's end, bangles darkening. Yaman walks along the Hudson and its parallel mania. Yaman, the ailment of the heart. Yaman, night of beauty and torment. Yaman, alchemy of madness. Yaman, ascent upon the rungs of stars. Yaman, descent with white robe trailing. Yaman, the beloved's lamplit gathering. Yaman, golden throne of poetry. Yaman, this, the humming center of the universe. Yaman grieves and glissandos, collects like moonlight in a lake. Yaman skips her resting note and rises to a frenzy. Yaman purifies the night of sin. See, she says, in ardor is witness. Yaman trembles like lightning, shivers beneath blankets the way a prophet might. Yaman sleepless trails off in exhaustion, but summons and extends each note like a silver thread. Tell her, if you are holy, you must sing into eternity. Never rest on the tonic, lest it be your last breath. trying to be aware of time. Um, so this a poem is about Begum Akhtar, uh, who is, uh, who actually inspired Arisha Shahid Ali a lot. He's written poems about her. Um, and she she was someone who uh, sang ghazals. Um, she sang Fazim and Faz and Ghalib. <clears throat> excuse me uh and there was a period in her life where um due to ideas of proprietor propriety and um respectability and probably related to ideas of orthodoxy and religion um she was um she stopped singing like after she got married to this lawyer guy um and this is about that a song for Begum Akhtar. Akhtari, your cry a dark spell, your sway over men wicked. Smother your beauty, a woman isn't made for spectacle, a woman can ruin a man. Soundless Akhtari clo cloaks herself in smoke, finds in it a new way of breathing. In death she finds life, in glasses of whiskey her own image. The doctors say she will die if she cannot sing. So she pulls breath like a thread from her red heart. One evening, she rises to the fifth octave and collapses. I think I'm going to be skipping a few, if that's OK. Um, this is about uh, Sony, who uh, is a figure in Punjabi legend, um, who, um, who went across the river Chenab um, to meet her lover, um, but she didn't know how to swim. So she used an earthen pot to um, uh, keep her afloat. And so th this is me trying to create a suite of poems that, that sort of uh, uh, converse with one another. Um, but I thought Sony's story was similar to mine because she was actually uh, cheating on her uh, husband. And, and so for me, the, the idea of her, um, she eventually drowns. Um, and the idea of her drowning feels very close to retribution. Um, so need to her earthen pot. As it dusks and the Chenab's waters turn, hold me, take me across this deep raging God's wrath. The night is cold, rising, a dome and then a world. Hold me, the water surges like a flame. When I leapt, my mind woke to my eyes madness, my color scattering into dark and marveled. You so close to dissolution, a silver hair sustaining a dream of heaven, stay whole. 
How these cruel waves lash my lover's bare back. Sony, he cries, gasping for air. Sony. His voice breaks, descends, dissolves. How much time do I have? I think like you're good. I'm gonna be here to spell them, so you're you're good. Okay, I'm just gonna check. Um, okay. I'm gonna skip her. Um, sorry, I'm just saying this for um, the interpreter. What Khizr told Alexander after Derrida. Alchemy is a fairy tale for kings. What is noble is gold, and while a pawn can become a queen, it is only in some versions of the game. Either way, the binary is upheld, and the king starts to believe he is favored by his very substance. Who will tell him the water of life is filtered and mixed with ground bones and tendons? It is his intellect that has brought him here. He sees a rung on the golden ladder, which is not there except its phantom, the step that raises him above the human king, brings him closer to God. Forgive him. He will chase this fancy into his mind's wilderness, lose himself in its eternity. Um... This is uh, going to be my final poem. Uh, I just want to thank Jose, uh, Ruja, Hanan, um, and Katie, and Suffolk uh, for um, being with me here and for uh, inviting me. Um, this last poem is titled The Poet, uh, and it's for Fez Ahmed Fez, um, who is my favorite uh, poet in Urdu. Um, and it's actually about um, Faiz was um, in prison for many years of his life because he, he was a dissident. Um, and there was uh, one time that uh, he was in prison um, on his wife's birthday. And so he wrote her, he was a pretty famous poem, poet by then. And um, he wrote her a poem um, and he gave it to her. And she was like, okay, thank you for this poem that you wrote for me. and. Um, and then he was like, no, no, like I gave it to you so you can sell it and buy something nice for yourself. And uh, I always hear Fez talking about this, you know, um, beloved, like the, this ideal, um, this woman who isn't real, but you know, he had, he had a wife and he wrote poetry for her. Um, the poet for Fez. The poet writes from his darkness a love poem. Sell it, he tells her. Let the gold of its letters, which is the yellow of a tree turning barren, adorn the distances of desire. For in the ether of his imagination, he longs not for alchemy, but for an earthly beloved, who breathes despite the world's cruel God, despite its countless exalted sorrows. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Um, it's Eric again for Anand, Ruja, and Adiba. Lovely readings. Adiba, these new poems are fire. Um, I'm over here just, I want that, that line about the um, the breath like a red thread. I'm like, I'm going to be thinking about that. So thank you. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. And thank you to all of you for taking the time to be here. Uh, thank you to Katie. And thank you to Bernan for co-hosting, for Matthew, who is here from the university, helping us out on the back end there. Um, yes, agreed. So, so good. Absolutely incredible. And yeah, everybody, I'm going to hit the recording button. Stop this. And um, <laughs>